Welcome to the final part of Lecture 4. In this part of this lecture, we're going to look at the remaining three steps of the process that we use to convert a partial differential equation, derived from a transport equation, into a system of parallel simultaneous algebraic equations. Now, we're going to start by examining how to use a finite difference method to approximate gradients. And we'll see there's various ways in which we can write the approximation to a gradient. And all of those approximations will be in algebraic form. Now, what we do after that is we take our partial differential equation and we substitute in those gradient approximations. And we have to do this in a different way, depending whether within the bulk of the domain, far away from a boundary, or whether we're at a boundary with a specific type of boundary condition. And some boundary conditions are quite straightforward. Other boundary conditions are quite subtle. And we'll see an example of both of those. Now, once we've discretized our PDE, what we end up with is an algebraic equation that applies at every point in the solution domain. And so if we've got n nodes in our solution domain, we're going to have n simultaneous equations that we need to solve. What we can do is we can write these equations in such a way that we can write a matrix vector equation that contains all the information that we need. Now this is really, really powerful because from a computational standpoint, the solution to my discretized partial differential equation just becomes a matrix inversion. And next lecture, we're going to be looking at techniques for matrix inversion in some detail. So let's start by reminding ourselves of the problem that we got to last time. We had thermal conduction. We had an insulated rod. We had temperature gradients only in one direction. We had a hot end at temperature T1, and we had a cooler end where we weren't specifying a temperature, but we were specifying a rate of energy loss, a heat flux. We discretized our solution domain using finite differences, and we used n nodes. Node 1 was at the hot end, node n was at the cold end, and somewhere away from the boundaries, we've got a general node, and I'm calling the general node I, and node I has two nearest neighbors, I plus 1, and I minus one. Now, let's start by thinking how we write first order derivatives in terms of finite difference approximations. There's three quite simple ways we can write this. Let's do a thought experiment. Let's imagine we're standing in our solution domain at node I, and we're looking out towards the cold end of the rod, and we can see our nearest neighbor, node I plus one. One way in which we can approximate a gradient at node i is to say, well, look, what's the temperature at node i plus 1? Let's subtract it from the temperature at node i, and let's divide it by the difference between the two. And so this is something that we call a forward difference. dt by dx at node i equals roughly ti plus 1 minus ti over delta x, where delta x is the distance between nodes i and i plus 1. Of course, we can extend this logic, can't we? Because if we're standing at node i and we turn away from node i plus 1 and around 180 degrees, we see node i minus 1. So another way in which we can approximate the gradient is to say, well, let's take the temperature where I am at node i, subtract it from the temperature one away from me at node i minus 1, and divide it by the distance between us, delta x. That again will give me an approximation of the temperature gradient where I am. And we call this difference a backward difference. Sometimes this is called an upwind difference. And we're going to be talking a lot more about upwind differencing in a few lectures time, because it has very important physical meaning. But we're not going to talk about that here. Now, there's a third way in which we can write an approximation to a gradient. Let's imagine that I'm standing at node i, and I look towards one of my nearest neighbors, i plus 1, and say, right, I'm going to take the temperature at node i plus 1. And then I look the other way and see my other nearest neighbor at i minus 1, and I take the temperature at node i minus 1. The distance between these two nodes is now 2 delta x, assuming equal node spacing. It doesn't have to be, but let's make that assumption. And so I end up with something called a central difference, where I have an approximation of the gradient in temperature where I am at node i, written as ti plus 1 minus ti minus 1 over 2 delta x. So we've got these three choices in terms of how we approximate a first order derivative. Let's see if there's any logic that we can use to help us choose which one of these gradient approximations to use. So we're going to do this by means of a graphical experiment. 
Here on my whiteboard, I have a temperature as a function of distance. So temperature on the y-axis, on the x-axis nodal position, and the vertical dashed lines are nodes i, i plus 1, and i minus 1 respectively. Now, if I'm interested in the gradient of temperature at node i, I can clearly illustrate it by drawing a tangent at that point. So here we go, there is a tangent at node i, that, so that's my temperature gradient at node i. So how well do these approximations get to the gradient of the tangent? Let's start with my forward difference. To construct my forward difference, I'm going to draw a line between the point of intersection between my temperature curve and nodal positions i plus 1 and i, which is the purple line that you see there on the whiteboard. And we can see that the gradient of the purple line is rather different to the gradient of the blue line. It's a very rough approximation. I could make that approximation better by decreasing the distance between node i and node i plus 1, make delta x smaller, which means I have more nodes in my solution domain, which, as we'll see later, means more memory and more solution time. OK, so using the node spacing I've chosen, forward differencing seems a bit rough. How about backward differencing? I've rubbed out the purple line and I've plotted a red line which corresponds to my backward difference. Again, it's the points of intersection between my temperature curve and nodal positions i minus 1 and i. And if we compare the gradient of my red line compared to the gradient of my tangent, the blue line, again we'll see it's quite a rough approximation. OK, so forward differencing and backward differencing gives us what seems to be like quite rough approximations to the gradient. Can we do any better? Well. Let's look at central differencing. So I've rubbed out the red line and put this black chain dashed line on. And these join the points of intersection between the temperature curve and nodal positions i plus 1 and i minus 1. And using the nodal spacing that I've chosen, we can see that actually central differencing gives us a far better approximation to the gradient than either of forward or backward differencing. Is this fluke? Is this serendipity? Well, I've drawn the temperature curve in a certain way. But there's more at play here than luck alone, because actually you can prove mathematically that forward differencing and backward differencing are only first order accurate, whereas central differencing is second order accurate, which is far better if we're trying to compute an accurate solution. So we can elect to choose any one of our differencing techniques that we have here on the board. We will elect to use central differencing for the time being, but there's a very important caveat here because our choice of differencing greatly affects two things. The obvious thing it affects is accuracy. Forward differencing and backward differencing are less accurate than central differencing, and so we would expect a finite difference formulation based on either forward or backward differencing to give us an inferior solution compared to central differencing. However, in some scenarios, if we've got certain physics at play, central differencing won't give us a stable solution but something like backward differencing will. We'll explore this more in a few lectures' time, but the take-home message now is choose your differencing technique with care because it can affect accuracy and stability of your solution. Now, once we've calculated a gradient, we can then use that to calculate what the temperature of the next node in our solution domain is. So imagine in our conduction problem we've got a known value of temperature at T1, what we want to do is calculate T2. If we can calculate the gradient in temperature at T1, then we can rearrange whatever differencing equation that we're using, and I've illustratively used forward differencing here, to calculate what T2 is. So T2 would be dt by dx at node 1 times delta x plus T1. And so recursively we can apply that idea throughout our entire solution domain to get an idea of what the temperature profile looks like. Now, let's go ahead and discretize our partial differential equation. We're going to start by looking at a point far from boundaries, and we'll deal with the complication of boundaries in a minute. And we're going to elect to choose central differencing because of its second order accuracy. Now, the first challenge that we see when we look at the transport equation on the board is that we've got a second order derivative rather than a first order derivative. So we need to figure out how we write in differencing terms the approximation for a second order derivative. Now, we can do this relatively straightforwardly. 
The equation that I've just written on the board there, I've highlighted in colour two terms. In red, I've got a temperature gradient, and in blue, I've got a temperature gradient. And I'm saying to start with that, look, my second order derivative, d2t by dx squared, is simply the gradient of a gradient. So it is d by dx of dt by dx. And so if I'm calculating the red group of red terms at node i, minus 1, and the group of blue terms at node i plus 1, then we can take the difference and divide by the distance between them. However, if we look more carefully at that, that's not what I've done here, because that can be a little inconvenient, because we have to change our formulation a bit and it gets less obvious. Let's look at the group of red terms to start with. We can see that we've got there ti plus 1 minus ti over delta x, which looks like a forward difference calculating the gradient at node i. Actually, this is, this is a central difference based on a midway point. Let's assume I have a node at i plus a half. If I'm at i plus a half, then a central difference which calculates the temperature gradient at i plus a half is ti plus 1 minus ti over delta x. And correspondingly, we've got the same logic at a nodal position i minus a half. And that's in blue. At i minus a half, as a central difference formulation, ti minus ti minus 1 over delta x is a central difference for node i minus a half. OK, so we're calculating temperature gradients, dt by dx, at i plus a half and i minus a half. And then we're using central differencing once again to get the gradient of our gradients at node i. So we've got dt by dx at i plus a half minus dt by dx at i minus a half over delta x gives us d2t by dx squared. And if I just write that out, I can see what I get is ti plus 1 minus 2ti plus ti minus 1 over delta x all squared. And that is a central differencing approximation to my second order derivative. OK, so that's how we write a second order derivative algebraically using central differencing. Now, this is good. If we examine this equation, we can see that we can write terms explicitly for ti plus 1. It's k over rho cp times 1 over delta x squared. For ti, it's got a pre-multiplier of minus 2k over rho cp all over delta x squared. And then ti minus 1, we've got, again, k over rho cp times 1 over delta x squared. So as long as we're far away from a boundary, that expression makes sense, because we've got enough nodes, if we're standing at i, to have a node at i plus 1 and i minus 1. If we're standing on a boundary, we run into a problem, don't we? Because if we are wanting to work out the gradient at node 1, then if i equals 1, i plus 1 equals 2, that's fine i is 1, that's fine, i minus 1 is 0, that's outside our solution domain, it makes no sense. Likewise for n, if i is equals n, we've got an n plus 1 term, and so we need to be very careful how we apply our boundary conditions to our transport equation. So, let's see how we do that. Let's look at node 2, not node 1, but node 2. We can see that writing that central differencing term at node 2, we've got nearest neighbours 1 and 3, and so we've got all the information we need. So we've got t3 minus 2t2 plus t1 over delta x squared. Now don't forget, we know what t1 is. It's our specified hot temperature. We don't need to solve for it. It's part of our boundary value formulation. And so we don't actually need to have a solution of a differential equation that describes node 1. It's just constant. So we don't solve a PDE at node 1. The first node we solve for is at node 2 because we know the value of temperature at node 1. So constant temperature boundary conditions are really straightforward to implement into a finite difference model. Now let's look at the other end of our domain at node n. We've got heat flux there. And if we want to calculate a gradient using central differencing at node n, 
we've got this n plus 1 term hanging around that again is a node outside the domain that makes no physical sense. Let's look at what heat flux is again. Q is our heat flux. It's minus k dt by dx, a temperature gradient. And if we're losing heat to the outside world, it's equal to my heat transfer coefficient h times a temperature driving force, t minus t infinity. Right, OK. So what we can do in effect is say, look, my heat flux, q, it's a specified quantity. It's equal to minus k dt dx. Well, I can write minus k dt by dx as an approximation using one of my differencing methods. I've elected to use a, oh, a forward difference here, tn plus 1 minus tn over delta x. That's how I could write dt by dx. There's no reason why I couldn't use a central difference as well. tn plus 1 minus tn minus 1 over 2 delta x. That would still give me an approximation to dt by dx. Now, What's Q also equal to? My heat transfer coefficient times temperature driving force. So, my discrete version of my gradient, Tn plus 1 minus Tn over delta x, is equal to that temperature driving force times heat transfer term. So minus H over K, Tn minus T infinity. Basically, regardless of whether I choose forward differencing or central differencing to write this derivative in, I can get an explicit expression for what Tn plus 1 is just by consideration of what's going on at the boundary. And if I can get an expression for Tn plus 1, that means at node n, if I want to take a gradient using central differencing, I need information about n minus 1 and n plus 1. Look, I've got what Tn plus 1 is in terms of nodes that are in the domain or nodes that involve the outside world, Tn and T infinity. And so if you've got a flux condition, you can play this little trick whereby you can insert what's known as a, a phantom node at n plus 1. It doesn't really exist in reality. But you can work out what the temperature at that phantom node would be in terms of information you already know. In this case, at node n and at t infinity, which is my ambient temperature, which is specified as part of the problem. So we can insert that now into our transport equation, our discrete version of our transport equation. So that's really, really convenient. So here is my transport equation written at node n. And so we can see that we've got in blue t n plus 1, which ordinarily would be a problem but it isn't any longer because of this phantom node approach where I've derived an expression for what n plus 1 would be in terms of information I already know. So let's insert that expression into n plus 1. And now we can see that our PDE is all in terms of things that we know about. Tn, the temperature at node n, is involved quite a lot. There's two terms there now with it. We'll combine those together in a minute. Our ambient temperature, T infinity, is there as well, as well as Tn minus 1. And so with a little bit of rearrangement, we end up with something that looks like this. And I've, if you follow the colours, you can see where N and N plus 1 terms end up. So if you've got flux-type boundary conditions, there's a little bit of subtlety as to how they're implemented. But they don't pose a problem so long as you think about them carefully. We're nearly there now. We've got expressions for our PDE in discrete form at a general point in our domain. We've got an expression for our PDE at node 2, which is next to our constant temperature node 1, so we don't need to solve for node 1. And thinking about our flux boundary condition, we've derived an expression for node n. So we have these expressions for node i, for node 2, and for node n. Now. What we want to do is to assemble all these equations, and remember that there are n minus 2 equations that correspond to i. We want to assemble this in a more compact form. And so what we're going to do is we're going to write a matrix and a vector plus a vector. OK, so this is what we write. Let's look carefully at this. In red, we've got a matrix of multipliers. Note that most of the values in this matrix are 0. And we only have non-zero entities on the diagonal, 
the subdiagonal and the superdiagonal. That matrix of terms multiplies a temperature vector. So here in our temperature vector we have T1, T2, T3, all the way through to our general nodes Ti minus 1, Ti, Ti plus 1, through to the nodes near the flux boundary Tn minus 1 and Tn. Then we know that matrix times a vector has got to equal vector. We've then adding that to another vector, which is T infinity, scalar, multiply a vector of things that are to do with a boundary. And we'll see it's almost uniquely zero, except at our flux boundary condition, where we have a non-zero term. And so we've effectively got vector plus vector equals zero. OK. Now, if you don't believe me in terms of this representing the equations we've just looked at, let's look at the middle bunch of terms that correspond to I. So if you look right in the centre of the matrix, you'll see on the central row, we've got 1 over delta x squared, which multiplies in blue ti minus 1. Then we've got minus 2 over delta x squared times ti. Then we've got 1 over delta x squared times ti plus 1. So if we go back to our previous slide, we can see now that that is a statement of summation that we have at node i. ti plus 1 over delta x squared minus ti 2 over delta x squared plus ti minus 1 1 over delta x squared. So indeed these equations can be written in this form. And if you go through the top left hand corner and the bottom right hand corner of the matrix, you'll see again those correspond to the boundary conditions. And we, if you look at T1 specifically, we'll see it's all multiplied by zero on the top row of the matrix because we're not solving for T1 directly. T1 specified. So we can very neatly write this in shorthand. We've got a big matrix M. We've got a temperature vector T. We've got a boundary condition vector B. We've got our ambient temperature scalar, T infinity. So M T plus T infinity B equals zero. OK, what are we trying to do? We're trying to solve for T. So we can rearrange this equation and solve for T, because that will give us our temperature gradient. So if we think about this, we've got a simple equation. All that we do is invert it. T is minus t infinity m inverse times b. m in this case is a matrix that is very, very sparse. Most of its values are zero. And the pattern I've drawn on there on the board is what's termed a sparsity pattern. It's an illustrative graphical way of showing you the matrix structure of non-zero terms. We've got a, a diagonal, a superdiagonal, and a subdiagonal, with everything else being zero. Now this matrix inversion problem can be solved relatively straightforwardly. Now, if we know the structure of sparsity on our matrix, and we term this matrix actually a tridiagonal matrix, we can invert those matrices incredibly efficiently. And we're going to be talking a lot about matrix inversion next lecture. And the first thing we'll see is that there are dedicated algorithms for the inversion of banded matrices and a triagonal tri-diagonal matrix is an example of a banded matrix. So the key message here is that the, the numerical solution to our heat transfer problem is just a matrix inversion. And when it comes to finite volume codes, you find exactly the same applies. And so a lot of the controls that you see in CFD codes relate to how matrices are inverted. And we're going to be talking about that a lot more next lecture. So let's summarize a few key points. Matrix inversion is a key step to the numerical solution of partial differential equations. In the example that we've just looked at, we use finite differencing methods to set up that linear system with which we use to derive that matrix. We use central differencing to approximate gradient terms within the bulk of our solution domain. Central differencing because it's second order accurate rather than first order accurate. We had to take great care with our boundary conditions. We had different considerations for our constant temperature boundary condition as we had for our flux boundary condition. And in fact, our flux boundary condition, we had to introduce something called a phantom node in order to evaluate our central differencing at node n correctly. We've seen from the last slide that a single matrix inversion will now solve this problem for us. So 
Let's look forward to next lecture where we can think all about matrix inversion techniques.